Welcome to your College Bound Kid, a podcast for parents, college counselors, students, and anyone who wants a weekly deep dive into the world of college admissions. My name is Dave. I'm a parent of a daughter in college, and we live in Chicago, Illinois. I'm Lisa, and I'm a clinical psychologist and college counselor. I have a daughter in college, a daughter in high school, and a son in middle school. After 30 years in Chicago, we recently moved to North Carolina. My name is Mark. I'm a college coach in Atlanta and the parent of two daughters, Karis, a graduate of Davidson College, and she is the founder of the Spanish tutoring company, SpanishHelpToday.com. And Joy is a graduate of the University of Georgia, and she is getting her master's degree at North Carolina State University. Good, and quite a few announcements today, and then we'll get into our preview for our new interview. First announcement is about the University of Redlands, which I can't wait to talk to you guys about. I visited last week, and I'll be doing um, a spotlight on it uh, coming up. Uh, that one, I think, will probably be in January, uh, either late January or early Feb. But they're in the news. The University of Redlands, a nonprofit institution in Southern California, it plans to acquire Presidio Graduate School. Now, this is a nonprofit operating in the San Francisco area. And after the graduate school determined its financial outlook required it to find a partner or close. And this new agreement with Presidio, which has been operating a hybrid program, including weekend residencies in the Bay Area and a permanent home at the Marin, uh, Marin County campus, about 15 miles northwest of San Francisco. And University of Redlands took on that campus back in 2019 when it acquired San Francisco Theological Seminary. So what uh, the advantage to this is that by adding Presidio, it's going to offset declines that Redland has had seen in its MBA students since the pandemic. Uh, they currently have about 300 students in their MBA program. Um, business is by far their strongest program, and I'll be talking more about that coming up in future weeks. Now, you know I've shared with you the revolt, the boycott, of U.S. news by several elite universities in this country when it comes to their law school admissions, first started by Yale and then Harvard and then a number of other of your leading law schools have chimed in and supported and made the same decision. Well, it's not only elite law schools anymore because Campbell's law school dean, Rich Leonard, is joining the group. It's more risky for your non-elite schools to do it. You know, the elite schools have established enough brand name that they don't really, you know, need U.S. News to um, convince people that they're they're getting a lot for their money. Uh, for these lower schools, you know, they always wonder, are they going to experience what happened to Reed College and have U.S. News punish them and drop them? Um, but Richard Leonard is having none of it. So he says that the U.S. News ranking methodology relies in part on evaluations from lawyers, judges, and other law schools. Reputational assessments that disadvantage the regional law schools. And collectively, these count for around 40% of their methodology. That's not the only beef Rich Leonard has with the U.S. News World and World Report's law school rankings. He says the, the publication underweights factors that are critical to prospective students such as bar passage rate and employment outcomes. He goes on to say, the U.S. news methodology is substantially flawed, and we are no longer willing to spend the significant administrative time necessary to comply with requests for data irrelevant to the needs of our prospective students. So he came, and he came strong. Well, they're not the only ones to make that decision. University of Virginia's law school, which had been ranked eighth, and its dean, Risa Gulaboff, said in a statement, the rankings failed to capture much of what we value at UVA, facilitating access to legal education and the legal profession from students of every background, fostering the free exchange of ideas within a community of joy, humanity, and trust, providing top-notch teaching by accomplished fa faculty supporting public service, and launching our graduates into stellar paths of their choosing. Now, I'm beginning to wonder what's up with some schools like Chicago and Cornell that have not joined the group, because the case is just so overwhelming 
about how flawed it is, I get not wanting to unilaterally disarm. But when the overwhelming majority of your peers are speaking out with such a credible case, it's making a statement for those particularly that are ranked high that are not joining, in my opinion. And it's, 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 it's not making a good statement. I'll leave it at that. Okay, um, some more news to in higher ed. There's a lot. Colleges saw rising costs increase in 2022 at a higher rate since 19, the 1980s. So they're up 5.3% in expenses, um, and they have not had that level of increase in costs. What has been the biggest culprit? Utilities. Utilities are up 43.1% in year-over-year comparison. Also, supplies and materials up 21.5%. Now, a company called Common Fund studies this, and they found that faculty salaries rose only 2.1%. And the lack of of increases in wages, particularly full-time faculty members, has led to a decrease in basically 5% of their real income adjusted for inflation. And that's one of the reasons why you're seeing a, a lot of turnover. So, you know, we've got a real problem right now um, with with um, the cost in, in higher ed. And I'll be talking more about that in a second. All right. NLRB. They are taking steps to recognize college athletes as employees. What is NLRB? It is the National Labor Relations Board, Los Angeles Regional Office. They determined on Thursday that charges of unfair labor practice against the University of Southern California, USC, the Pac-12 Athletic Conference, and the NCAA have merit. Now, this development is widely seen as a step in the direction of college athletes being treated as employees. Another big tidbit in the news has to do with TikTok. A number of governors, particularly in conservative states or Republican governors, have banned TikTok for state employees and state networks. Some of these governors include Maryland, South Carolina, South Dakota, Nebraska, Utah, recently Georgia. And then colleges are ban- banning uh, TikTok in certain instances. Auburn just announced a ban on all use of TikTok this week. With more than 1 billion users, TikTok, owned by the Chinese company ByteDance, is one of the world's most powerful social network. And since its inception in 2018, American lawmakers have been raising concerns about the security practices. In other words, what amount of knowledge are they able to glean from America and how is that going to be used? Now, one of the ways this is impacting colleges is that use use of TikTok in college admissions recruitment has become one of the most strategic tools colleges have. So it's become controversial. You're like cutting off part of their recruitment uh, strategy, although in certain cases, carve outs are being made for colleges. Now, if you didn't see what Purdue Northwest Chancellor said in his commencement's remarks, talk about reprehensible. Um, he made, I, I mean, I'm just gobsmacked. I mean, if you, you just just Google Purdue University Northwest Chancellor Thomas Keon, K-E-O-N, Google what he did and what he said um, about Asian Americans at a commencement speech. Um, it's really unbelievable that he has not had to step down yet. But, um, you know, I, I would expect more from a five-year-old than what he did. I know he's apologizing now, but sometimes, you know, you know, you can't, you can't, you can't put the toothpaste back in the tube when you do something like that. Um, the video went viral on Twitter. And if you haven't seen it, just look it up and ask yourself, how can this guy be a chancellor of a major university? All right, Tufts University received another bomb threat. Tufts University faced a bomb threat for two days in a row. Thursday, forcing colleges to evacuate campus and cancel classes. This is reported um, in the Boston News. Now, police gave an all-clear notice in the afternoon, but classes had remained canceled out of abundance of caution. The evacuation follows a similar incident that happened on Wednesday when Tufts Diversity Department received a bomb threat via email. And the university had carried out an anti-white racism stance, and they claimed the multiracial group placed bombs across several campus buildings, according to Boston.com. A search ensued. No bombs were found. Police are investigating both incidents. 
In Indiana, there's news. Anderson University is going to forgive thousands of dollars in student debt through their re-enrollment program. Anderson University in Indiana will forgive debt owed to its past accounts for more than 800 former students in a brand new program encouraging stopped out students, which is a term for people that left school before they graduated, stopped out. We've had that before in our admissions vernacular to re-enroll. The private Christian university will forgive debt held by former students who are 65 years and older or who attended before 2000. The new program called Raven Return will also forgive $5,000 over two semesters and three quarters of outstanding balance for students who re-enroll after at least being away for two years. A big announcement at Harvard, they have their 30th president, and they decided to stay within, and they hired Claudine Gay, the first black president in the institution's nearly 400-year history. Claudine Gay, the daughter of Haitian immigrants, will officially resume her position next summer. Uh, Gay is currently the Ederly Family Dean of Harvard's Faculty of Arts and Science. She was hired after a large search to replace Lawrence Bacow, who announced, re- announced in June he would be stepping down. Now, this is Gay's first presidency, but she does have a long history with Harvard. She earned a PhD in government in Harvard in 1998, and in 2008, she joined the faculty um, where she has taught and climbed the administrative ranks prior, prior to Harvard. She also taught at Stanford, where she earned her undergraduate degree in economics. So Dave called me all excited with that big news this week. The Supreme Court agreed to hear a second case on Biden's student loan forgiveness plan. Oral arguments for both cases will be scheduled in February. And while I personally am not expecting the Supreme Court to support Biden's loan forgiveness program, um, it looks like they're going to be okay at getting their new income-driven repayment plan through. That appears to be safe from legal challenges, uh, with a draft of regulations are expected to be released soon. Um, The New York Times reports that Colby Sawyer's college large tuition reduction and the growing trend of lowering tuition among small private colleges. We'll be talking a lot more about that. Uh, Dave and I are going to do on next in the news on on tuition resets and the number of colleges that are slashing their prices in some cases in half. So look for more of that coming up at the end of January with Dave and I. Now I have to give a shout out to Jennifer in Milwaukee. She is the first one to use SpeakPipe to send an encouraging message to one of our interviews. Interviewees. I'm encouraging um, you guys, if you and gals, to use SpeakPipe to send an encouraging message to any interview that touched you. And I got her permission to share her message, um, hopefully as an example to inspire others to do the same. So here we go. I want you to hear what Jennifer had to say. She was particularly moved by the interview with Arlene Cash. Hi, this is Jennifer from Milwaukee. I am just Recording this message for Arlene Cash to let her know how much I loved listening to her interview with Mark. I was listening to it the entire time, and in the beginning, when I heard all of her experience, I knew it was going to be exciting because I could tell how much experience she had, and I knew I was going to be listening to somebody that had a lot of wisdom. Toward the end, I was telling Mark how much I enjoyed listening to her out. Um, what to talk to college counselors, children, and parents about. She had really sound advice. Um, I really liked the piece where she said that, um, you know, telling kids, she gave the example of, you know, don't tell kids not to be a doctor, but tell them which college to go to if you want to be a doctor, maybe if you struggle on math or something. I thought that was great advice. She also gave other really good information. I was laughing out loud in the car. I kind of felt like she would be somebody that I could sit down and chat with, um, very easily somebody I would love to work with. She sounds really wise, and um, I would love to hear more of her in the future. So thank you for the interview from Milwaukee. You know, you have no idea how you'll encourage someone and make their day. In fact, sadly, shortly after my interview with Arlene, her husband surprisingly passed away. Uh, so this message by Jennifer is going to mean so much to Arlene. 
And so I share it with you, hoping to inspire you to leave messages for any interview that touched you. And we'll take care of the logistics and make sure that your message is de- delivered directly to interviewee. And if I want to encourage one of our interviewees, all you need to do is go to speakpipe.com forward slash YCBK and leave a message and we'll be sure to get the message to the interviewee. And now this week's interview with a special guest. Okay, friends, as I've said, we have a lot of talent in our parent body. And one such person is Gus Resendez from Massachusetts. And Gus and I have kept in touch over the last three to four years by a lot of texts and and emails. And um, I came to find out he's got a real passion for athletics. And he's had two of his students go all the way through the athletic process, a third going through it now. And we got to talking about the interview that we did with Trinity. We thought it was a excellent interview when it came to explaining the process of recruiting steps you need to take who do you contact when do you start should you see in video should you go to id camps all this kind of stuff but what that interview did not address is some of the potholes and pitfalls in recruiting and so that's what gus and i will be discussing over the next three weeks i think you're really going to learn a lot listen and enjoy friends you're in for a treat today i'm here with gus resendez and Gus is one of you. He's a parent, uh, but he's a unique parent. He's a parent who listens religiously to the podcast, who is one of the reasons why I refer to you guys as, as my listening family. Gus and I have communicated regularly for more than three years. In fact, we were supposed to meet almost three years ago now, and uh, the, uh, I think it was COVID and a flight delay caused that from happening. Um, so that never ended up happening, but we communicate regularly by text and regularly by email. And I feel he's got a story story to tell that uh, will relate to a lot of our listeners. So uh, you're going to be hearing from Gus over the next several weeks because uh, there's two topics in particular that I really want him to address. Um, we'll spend most of our time talking about the athletic perspective from a parent's uh, – the athletic process from a parent's perspective um, because he's got a very unique vantage point having had three kids – Nick, his oldest, Katie, his middle child, and Danny, his youngest, all either play college sports or, in the case of Danny, looks like he's on that path to play college sports. And so I want to talk about sort of the things you need to know as, as from a parent's perspective, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, and then after we finish that, Gus was a great person, I feel, to talk about co-op as well. And if that name sounds familiar to you, uh, I once read a quote on the air from Gus uh, about his co-op experience and how it opened up you know, unique opportunities for him. But we'll get to that. You'll hear that a few weeks down the road. But for now, Gus, without any further ado, why don't you uh, introduce yourself? You know, I like people to know the backstory so they, they know the person they're going to listen to over the next several weeks. Sure, Mark. Thank you for having me. It's a real privilege to be here. And, and I want to say thank you uh, to you and, and, and to the broader your College Bound Kid uh, community and podcast team, uh, yourself, obviously, Dave, uh, who, who I've really enjoyed over the years, and Lisa, and of course, uh, Anika in particular, uh, re- really, really uh, have learned a lot uh, around the process of college admissions and how colleges exist and, and, and their decision processes. And so thrilled to be here and hoping that uh, I can pass along some of my experiences and some of my uh, knowledge, uh, things that I've learned in the process and kind of pay it, pay it back to the community here. Cause I, I've learned a lot, not only from you guys, but from the questions and, and thoughts of, of the other parents. So, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you for, for all of your good work. Uh, well, you can probably tell it's, it's a, it's a total passion project. Uh, we wouldn't have gone to two episodes a week if it wasn't a passion <laughs> project. So, uh, and the extra stuff in the Dropbox and, and the quarterly, uh, yeah, I can, I can tell it comes through. And uh, it's really well received by by the parents community. I try to pass this along to uh, anyone who asks me any questions around, uh, you know, college and, you know, all of that process. So thank you. Uh, but with respect to, you know, my background, you know, a blue collar kid, you know, first gen uh, across the board, uh, you know, first gen here, first uh, gen, you know, kind of English speaker, first gen college, uh, all of that fun stuff. Uh, I, I grew up outside of Boston. 
and it went to Northeastern University when it was a very much a blue collar school, a little bit different than it is today, but uh, a fantastic place then, uh, a fantastic place now, just a little bit different uh, uh, from 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 then to here. And uh, went to went straight through to law school at University of Southern California, and then right into the workforce from there. So I've been practicing law for. A long time now, since last century, as my kids say. <laughs> so, uh, so I'm an old head uh, officially. Um, so, but you know, we'll talk about co-op and, and the great uh, opportunities and, and great experience that that uh, provided me and the, the platform it gave me in a, in a few weeks. And, and excited to talk about that. But what we're here for today is to talk about college recruiting. And so, I've got three kids. Uh, my wife Mary and I have uh, three kids. And uh, got to get her in there. <laughs> that's right. That's right. She's the real brains of the operation here. Let's let's be clear about that. Um, but uh, Nick is our oldest. He's uh, 21. He's a junior uh, at Assumption University in Worcester, Massachusetts. It's a Division II school, uh, and he played football through his sophomore year. And we'll we'll get into a little bit more about that in a bit. Uh, Katie is a freshman at uh, Claremont McKenna, and she plays on the Claremont Mud Scripts team. Uh, so. I'm sure you'll cover what the consortium is here, and uh, you, you've done it a little bit. I'm sure you'll do it again in the future. But she's at Claremont, and she's playing basketball there. My youngest is Danny. He's a, a junior at the local high school here in Andover, Mass, and he is playing basketball and starting the recruiting process. So we're hopeful that that'll go the way he hopes it will, uh, and uh, and that he'll have the opportunities he uh, is seeking there. But we've been through. Years and years of recruiting and visits and camps and AAU and personal trainers and personal weightlifting, uh, you know, skills development, all of that stuff. And, um, you know, happy to share my experience around that uh, here today with you. No, no, let's uh, let's get into it. I'm excited about it as well. You know, from listening to the podcast that my daughter played travel basketball exclusively, gave up all her other sports, even that she was quite a proficient athlete. From seventh grade on, um, traveled on a, a really high level team. Seven seven players that she played with played D one. Um, she ended up um, having D two and D three offers, but didn't like the schools. Yes, she had a certain type of college experience in mind, and she wasn't willing to give it up. And and she had no regrets. So it was the weirdest thing for her though, because her whole life was basketball. So she didn't even really know there was kind of another world out there. Um, and so like so many different paths that people take with this thing. Yes. And I've seen so much um, in the process. So parent to parent, I'm looking at looking forward to having this conversation with you. So why don't we just start by what what sort of got all your kids interested in athletics? Would you say just you and your wife are just the athletic types that just sort of exposed <laughs> them to it at a young age and, and they, they liked it? Or, you know, it's not that common that all three kids – look like they're going to play college sports without some strong um, inclinations from the parents. Uh, I, I am probably the least accomplished athlete in the house. <laughs> and, and when I say probably, I really mean definitely the, okay. the, the least accomplished athlete. Uh, my wife played basketball uh, in college for a little bit. Uh, you know, I rode for about 15 minutes uh, at Northeastern. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and we'll, we'll talk about what, uh, what what scholarships are available sure. and how the the economics of it all work a little bit here today too but you know the 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 kids uh you know we're t we're tall people um that certainly helps and 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 one of the things that that I always say to people it's it's um size speed and skill for your position uh and when i say for your position i really mean for the position that the coaches in college want you to play not sure. the position you may want to play um and so you know, they, they had, they were, you know, relatively tall kids, but, you know, relatively tall for normal people, <laughs> sure. normal size people. Uh, and, uh, you know, Nick is, uh, Nick and Danny are about six one, six two, and Katie's about 5'10". Um, so, you know, we, you know, we've, we've got much taller people in the family, um, but, uh, you know, but th that's about where they've topped out. And, um, you know, it's funny that you talk about your daughter's experience and she says, well, you know, part of her process was surely... I don't even know how I would exist without this sport, right? If I give it up and, and that was part of the thought process. And the one thing, uh, it, it re really kind of the first point I'd, I'd love to hit for, for the parent community here is to, to be honest about kind of 
expectations and, and opportunities for, for you, uh, for your child in, in this and what they want out of it. And it, there does have to be a match academically, athletically, uh, from an affordability perspective around all of this. You know, for wealthier families, they might say, well, you know, this helps with the pre-reads and it helps with all of that. And it's all additive um, in, in the admissions process. And it's all good. I don't have to worry about the money. Other folks might say, well, uh, that's not at all what we're <laughs> our situation. And so we, we really have to figure that all out. And, um, and, you know, I've seen a lot of families where they're looking at the process and saying, well, I have these offers but they're not in line with what I wanted to do academically. Uh, you know, some folks think that some of those higher end, uh, uh, you know, D3 schools academically are going to be a cakewalk to get into from a sports perspective. And it couldn't be further further from the truth. In some ways, they're the most competitive D3 opportunities out there from, from the, you know, from the courts and fields perspective. Um, you know, look at the folks at, at Trinity that you just had on, uh, you know, and, and, you know, you know, Justin and Paul did a great job kind of covering, you know, kind of the the match prospects there, right? Like you really want to make sure that the kids have, you know, if they're working towards some type of academic opportunity that they're not giving that up or vice versa. So in some ways, the the process can be limiting. And, and uh, I think some parents don't really realize that until they're way into it saying, well, okay, the, the, the you know, the the basketball team doesn't quite match the 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 department <laughs> that I that I want, and so it's really something to to dig into. But um, you know, for us, uh, you know, Nick Nick went through the process and he went to prep school uh, here in New England. It's a it's a big thing to to do up this way. I went to prep school and played with a lot of kids that uh, had really high high ceilings in in football and in basketball. He, he played foot basketball for a little while there. And uh, there are a couple kids that uh, are on NBA G League teams from some of his high school teams. But the, the thing that that and with Nick being our oldest and having had that opportunity, he was a heck of an athlete locally and was always a little bit faster, just had a little bit better vision, just a bit, little bit better feel of the game uh, from an early age. And so he had a lot of success as a young kid and that kind of built to your original question, you know, what got them going you know, they, they had the size and the speed and the skill and, um, and, you know, and they grew up in a competitive environment here at home, right? Sure. Around sports and, and all of that. Um, so they, they jumped into it. Um, but when he got to that prep school and he saw just how good some of these kids were, I think, I think we all quickly came to understand, okay, D2, D3, <laughs> like that's the ceiling here. Those D1 kids are different. And so, um, you know, I think Katie had a similar experience. It's, it's great to hear about your AAU experience with seven D1 girls. Katie had very much the same experience in AAU. And we would travel all over the country, right? Chicago, yeah. Louisville. Louisville yeah. in July is yeah. not fun. Um, <laughs> I know what that's uh, like. <laughs> and so, it, and, and there's a lot of expense around all of that. Oh, right? so a lot of expense. I, I watched some families go through this process thinking, my kid's going to go D2 and they're going to have a full scholarship. And and it's just not, I would, you know, maybe we can post something uh, on the on the blog here. I've got a couple of resources that I would send to people, Mark, that show the average size of scholarships based on the division, yes. based on the sport, right? And you've got a kid that's, you know, a D1 you know, I don't know, right-handed pitcher. I'm really out of my element using a baseball example here. But, you know, maybe, you know, some position that's, you know, uh, pretty common, let's say. Um, and uh, and they get a scholarship to, you know, a D1 school for baseball. It may only be a 10 or 15% scholarship. Oh, yeah. That's really, really common. I mean, a lot of people, you know, don't realize that uh... – you know, men's football, uh, yeah, that that can, that's full ride, but that's a small number. When men's and women's basketball, men's and women's soccer, right. uh, but after that, it's just women's volleyball and women's and gymnastics. Those are the only full scholarship sports. So, if you're a parent and and you and this is a really important aspect of the process for you, I would say two things. 
make sure you understand what a headcount uh, sport is. And, and what that means is that it's a scholarship. Uh, it's a sport where they give out full scholarships and they have a number of fixed scholarships. And then the, the other scholarships can be broken up. D2, you can break them up. And in D2, they're stacking. And so in D2, you have, you might get a, you know, six seventy five thousand dollar school you might get a ten thousand uh, dollar uh football scholarship and you might get fifty thousand of merit <laughs> and then you might have to borrow the delta or whatever that combination or ratio is right well here's something else too um so for other than those you know those headcount sports teams get caps right mm -hmm. maybe the entire um, team gets five scholarships or the entire team gets seven or nine that can be partially broken up amongst all the players. But, and especially, and I'm seeing this right now a lot because COVID really impacted schools financially. An individual school oftentimes will come, go to that head coach and say, yeah, by NCAA rules, we're allowed nine in our sport, but guess what? You get five for everybody because it still needs to be in accordance with our budget. And we're, you know, and those, we could replace those with families that could pay and we need that money. Yes. So a lot of times a team doesn't even get the, the full amount that they're allowed by NCAA rules for their sport and their division, which can really make, you know, partials. And I, I, I know there's that myth out there of the full ride that's very prevalent. The full ride is a rare, rare bird. Right. And, and if your kid is going to get a full ride in football or basketball, and you, you probably already have a sense of that by their freshman year. Right. And it, because they're already playing with the other, you know, the oldest and the best of the oldest, not, you know, and so you, you, you have a sense of it. The, the other point, though, it, it's, a, it's a great point to highlight with respect to individual schools and their budgets. The, the other item is the, the, the leagues. Right. So the Ivy League, the Patriot League, they all have their own limits. And so it's not the same as going to Boston College and in and, and, and the ACC where they're going to have their what full 85 scholarships. Yeah. For at the, at yeah. the Ivy League, there are there's no such thing as sports scholarships and there's no such thing as merit money. Mm hmm. Yeah. Right. At, at those places. And and that goes for the NESCAC. And, and I always get this conference name wrong. The UAA. Right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's got the Emory's in it and Chicago's and Hopkins and NYU and those big jot jot wash you and those big, very academic division three schools. Um, yeah. Those places, you know, you boy, you better bring it athletically. I mean, a academically. Mm -hmm. For those spots, and especially in niche sports, N niche meaning if there's no, not you know, not bringing any revenue in, and maybe not bringing the crowd together like a basketball, a football, or a soccer, you know, if you're doing cross country or something like that, you know, or or just so many different, so many different niche sports squash that I mean that are out there, like yeah, the perception is I think that. Yeah, it's true that athletics absolutely can get you in. It can absolutely help, no question. But the average student at those schools is quite strong academically because of the nature of those schools, who they are. And they're aware that, look, this sport is great, but it's not like it, it may be costing us money on a budget standpoint. And so, you know, we're not going to lower academic standards that much. Right. And, and they don't have to. The, the, right. the demand is there. When you're looking at, you know, one of the last schools you mentioned, WashU as an example, I mean, their, their, their acceptance rate is probably under 10%. Yeah. Right? It was right at 10 last year and it's dropping. And I, I've taken athletic kids through the pre-read process there. I know yeah. how tough and play and NESCAC too, the Tufts and schools like that. It, it's a little bit of a myth that, oh, just because you're a good athlete, you sail right in. Like it, it can be quite competitive getting a spot for an athlete at those high, high division three schools like that. Mm -hmm. So our kids are, uh, you know, so Nick went through the process and admissions wise, you know, he had some pre-reads at a number of places. Um, he wanted to push football uh, to, you know, he wanted to see how high a level he could play at. And, um, you know, he, um, he found himself with this opportunity at Assumption 
Uh, it's a really highly regarded D two school. Uh, uh, you know, the the LSU coach uh, is is uh, came through uh, Assumption, and the the stadium is named after him. They've had a lot of historical success, and um, and so he wanted to, to to really try. And he knew there was going to be a bit of an uphill battle for him there, but he wanted to give it a go. Um, so his process with respect to that, you know, at a D two school uh, like Assumption. Uh, the you know it's not the washu kind of admissions process if you will uh but it you know he you know he had that you know i, I mentioned the d2 stacking right so you you may you sometimes you get football money sometimes you don't get football money sometimes they, they can find you some merit money uh based on your relative uh, academic uh profile versus the you know the 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 general student body profile and, I, and, and I'm going to stop you there for a sec. I, I find they try to do that a lot because yes. obviously they, they, they know they can't offer a lot of full rides. Yes. And they, they want to win and coaches need talent to win. And they know money's oftentimes really important. So a lot of times it's, boy, what you, you know, if you can come with a good GPA or some test scores and a good combination, then we can give you this academic piece and combine it with this and, you can get, you know, a combination of athletic and academic money to try to make it work at those, not, not for those, not for the, the Ivies and the Patriots and the Nescacs and, and the other conferences, but that's, I find that's really common. I don't know if that was your experience. 100%. Yeah, that, that was absolutely our, our experience with, with the process at D2. And, you know, we felt like it was a, 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 a good match for Nick. Uh, maybe one day you'll do an assumption kind of uh, college review. I'll tell you about that. I think that I was a hint, listeners. He's, <laughs> he's trying to get us college spotlight out of assumption. <laughs> so uh, so it's it's got a great little business school there. Uh, they've got some other great colleges there. It's, it's really strong regionally. And uh, and we felt like you know as a business major there he would he would have some some nice success with that and then he could pursue some of his football dream, but as a parent in this process you know we had to really think through you know what's the package what's going to make him happy what's the opportunity he wants to go try to get here now look two years later right he's finishing his sophomore year and into spring practices because you know deep but let me let me back up one second Mark and, and give an overall description that a college coach once gave my daughter and uh we were talking to the coach after one of these camps and she was coaching at a d3 school had coached at a d1 school played d2 and i said coach can you describe the commitment level for each of the divisions to to katie and i had a pretty good sense of what the answer was going to be and and and, and I, I would you know I, I, what i heard was no surprise it was well d1 they pretty much own you year round Mm -hmm. Right. Right. D D two, they pretty much own you for the school year. And D three, they own you for the season. Now, for D two and D three, that doesn't mean you don't have to do anything when you're not on their clock. It means that they can't be in the room while you're working out, while you're reviewing film, or you're working on your skills training, while you're, you know, doing all of the other extra stuff that you have to do to maintain and improve because at every level, the coaches want to win. They want to recruit the best kids they possibly can. And in some ways, their job is to recruit over you every year once you get into college. That's really important. I hope everybody caught that. So uh, what Gus talked about is recruiting over. I'll, I've shared this story briefly before, but I'll share it again. So I worked with a student years ago. This when I was on the college side at Westtown on the um working with Susan at, at the Westtown School. And I'll throw his name out there. Doc Walker was his name. And so six foot seven, really talented basketball player. Uh, he had some good athletic genes. His parents met at Clemson, where his dad played basketball and his mom played volleyball. And his dad was still in the coaching profession. And so they came in with the understanding, I know how this works. Um, they're going to promise you the world. Mm-hmm. And make you feel like you're going to, you know, be a priority for them. And then they're immediately going to go out and try to rec recruit over you refers to try to find a better player at your position because their goal is to win. So here's what we're going to do. We're not going to go to the highest level that we can play at. We're going to go where they can't recruit over you. And they were all about academics. 
So you can look it up. Dockery Walker started started for Brown as a freshman. He was extremely athletic, six seven player in the Ivy League, because they didn't go to the highest level they possibly could because they said, uh, "You're going to play." And and I know you've seen this, Gus, because I've seen so much of it. You know, because my daughter played from seventh to twelfth grade, she played on a lot of teams with a lot of players, uh, about forty different players altogether that that play D one. She played with at different teams, and so we've kept in touch with a lot of those, you know, those families. And there's a there's a lot of disillusionment. One hundred percent. I would say the majority of those people, and I'm not trying to put a negative spin because college can be great, but the majority of people did not have a good experience. Like either one of two things happened: they either they either squeaked in a D1 school and barely played, and they found out, oh, that's not really fun. You know, getting up at five every morning and working your tail off, missing out on all the college experience. And I'm not getting I'm just sitting on a wooden bench or they experienced getting recruited over or they experienced being forced to play through injuries. And a lot of them were like, you know what? This this is the job. (laughs) And so don't get me wrong, but there were a lot of people that did have good experiences, too. There were a lot of transfers in there that occurred. You know, a lot of times they started D1 and ended up going to D2 or um, they ended up moving down somewhere where they would get a lot more playing time. And, you know, one thing I want to mention, and I know you can comment on, you kind of referred to this earlier. It's it's easy to have a misunderstanding of the the level that your child can play at because it's such a big jump <laughs> to go from being a high school superstar to being a recruitable athlete, you know, um, that's going to be able to play a lot. So I'll say this just briefly about my my daughter. So she's at a private school. So it's a K-12. And she's on an eighth grade team where they 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 pulled her up to play on, on, on the high school team. And her first game on the high school team, I'll never forget it. They won 42 to 28. And, and she scored 38 of the 42 points. Holy cow. Yeah. And so she was first team all region, you know, 1200 point high school score and all that. But she still was a D2 or D3 player and not a division one player with that kind of performance as an eighth grader. Right. And, you know, and so I say that not to brag on her, but just to say, even when somebody's like playing a year up, outscoring the entire team. Um, you, you know, this Gus is a, and I, I really feel a resonance with Gus cause you know, he would send me all these updates about his kids throughout the whole process. So I remember when Nick committed, I remember when Katie <laughs> committed. And so I, I kind of have an a deja vu talking to you about this, but it's also tough if you, if you're undersized for your sport. So yes. she, so yes. she's, she's five, six, like 115 pounds. And at that size and height, you know, you have to just either just be a f- absolute phenom in some way because the, a lot of times coaches do have certain size and expectations in mind unless you're just a you're just a phenom and there's a lot of overpromising that occurs well not only from you know the overpromising comes from a lot of different perspectives yes and if you're not careful as a parent there's going to be a hand in your pocket <laughs> and in your wallet 24/7 yes uh hey your kid needs uh, special uh, weightlifting training. Your kid needs this special skills training that this guy who coached this guy in the NBA can do. Uh, the AAU team's got extra workouts. Like, hey, we are going to do an extra trip. Like, we are on kid number three. And let me tell you the number of things that we have passed on Yeah, for, for Danny – where I have said, you're not going to spend six hours in a car each way and then go play four or five games in ill time, ill suited gyms for, you, you know, where the competition is going to be really bad or way too good for you. <laughs> and, um, and it's, you would be better off getting a few workouts in at home. You know what you're supposed to do. You know, getting up the shots with with the gun, the the uh, you know the machine that you, sure. know, you put the shot in and it shoots it right back to you, so you can put up four or five hundred shots in a in a day. That, that's where the kids get better. It's not where they they don't get better 
where you're where you've got all these families screaming and yelling from the sidelines in some meaningless game where the other team has a six foot eleven kid and you know where you have the six foot eleven kid and the game's already stacked. <laughs> right. I mean, I, I'm really grateful that my daughter Joy um attributes some of her most precious and fondest memories to yes. all of those six years where we mm-hmm. traveled all over the country competing. Mm-hmm. Because from my perspective, now don't get me wrong, I had tremendous bonding time with her. But yes. Oh, that that car time is the best. Oh right? yeah, yeah. And the <laughs> hotels and you know what I mean? And yes. Going out and doing all that. That was so much fun. But but there was so much disillusionment. And you know, I know we spent a fortune and of course she, you know, she never even ended up playing sport, you know, playing at the college level, but um, it's okay. But I look back at it, like some of the disillusionment I saw came at the AAU level. I felt yes. there was a tremendous amount of overpromising. They like to show you these few kids that went on to play at this level. And first of all, a lot of those kids might have bounced around from different AAU teams and three or four different programs are all claiming them. And they like to make it sound like they're your ticket. And a lot of times, the AAU personnel, they're they're not always completely honest with you at your chances at playing at a certain level. Because if they if they say to a parent or a kid, um, listen, you know, there there's a chance they could maybe play college, maybe a D3. We haven't talked about this yet, but there's there's high, mid and low within each division. Right. It's not just D3, D2, D1. You got high, mid and low. Maybe you could play low D3. You know what? What happens? Parents a lot of times and kids, you know, it's what I call D1 or bust mindset. That's not what they want to hear. So if an AAU coach says that to a player or a parent, look, there might be a 20% chance you could play college. Then they, and I've seen this, I know you've seen this happen. It's so easy to just quit that team and go find someone else that tells you what you want to hear. So then the the incentive structure is that the coaches don't want to level set with the parent or the family. And they try to make it sound like, look at all these kids that we've had go off and do this. Mm-hmm. And and that can lead to a lot of disillusionment. Friends, this concludes the first part of our three-part interview. I hope you'll join us next week for part two of three. Okay, friends, on Thursday's episode, Julia is back. And we will be discussing an article from Stephanie Saul that appeared in the New York Times pretty recently entitled, Elite College's Quiet Fight to Favor Alumni Children the pushback against the resistance to legacy admissions. A question from a listener will also be a speak pipe question. And that's from Eric in Iowa. And he has a series of questions about working with a college coach, an independent educational consultant. And then we got another question anonymously about working with an independent educational consultant. So we'll play both of those questions Over the next two weeks, we'll answer questions related to that. Who do you work with? When do you work? What do they do? All that sort of thing. And our interview was with Wendy Beckemeyer. She's the VP of Enrollment at Cornell College. And we'll be talking about understanding Cornell College. And that's part two of three. See you on Thursday, everybody. And remember, friends, you cannot take the elevator to success. You have to take the stairs. But here's the good news. The staircase is always open. And that's our show. A big thank you to you, our listeners, for tuning in this week. If you find this podcast helpful, please follow us and you'll get every single episode as soon as it is released. If you're interested, there are a few ways you can really support our podcast. You can click the share button and send it to your friends and acquaintances. You can help us pay our staff and our expenses by donating on our website. You can write a review for us on Apple or Spotify. I'm the producer of the podcast, but we have a fantastic team of 14. Shout out to our co-host, Dr. Lisa Ruff, Dr. David Williams, Susan Tree, Vince Garcia, and Julia Esquivel. And to our substitute co-host, Sylvia Borgo. Our sensational sound engineer is Nemanja Matvich. Our amazing music is from Victor Allen Weeks. Marketing designs are from Kimberly Blass. Lily Parikh manages our Instagram. 
Our image editor is Talha Khan. Joyce Ducker does our website episode updates. And our webmaster is Stalianos Dimitriou. If you want to have a coaching session with Lisa or me, just text me at 404-664-4340. If you have a question you want us to answer, or if you have a recommended resource or article you think we should discuss, just send it to questions at yourcollegeboundkid.com. By the way, check out our website, where you'll find lots of content that is not on any podcast app. Our website is yourcollegeboundkid.com. If you want to learn about other hot admissions topics, follow us on Twitter at YCBK Podcast. We think of you as our listening family, and we look forward to meeting again with you every single Thursday.